Germany is being left behind as the global economy outperforms expectations. That's a conclusion you can draw from the International Monetary Fund's latest World Economic Outlook update. So let's discuss what the IMF thinks 2024 has in store with Petio Koeva Brooks, Deputy Director of the IMF's Research Department. Thanks a lot for being with us here on DW Business. Uh, if I can just put you on the spot to start with and ask you to sum up in just a sentence what 2024 is looking like from a global economic perspective. Sure. For the global economy, we see um, declining inflation and steady growth, which opened a clearer path to a softer landing. A soft landing. OK, so that's that's generally good news mm -hmm. for the, the world economy as a whole. But let's have a look at how growth is going around the world. Let's uh, get a quick look at uh, just a quick map that we put together. The uh, strongest growth that we're seeing in 2024, according to the IMF, is going to be coming out of Asia with solid figures for India and parts of Southeast Asia. The IMF expects 4.6% growth from China, although I think Beijing would prefer that to be somewhere closer to 5%. The 2.1% projected for the USA is stronger than previous forecasts, but look at that figure for Germany. It's lagging well behind as Berlin struggles to get the wheels going again and get its economy up to speed. Just 0.5% growth forecast for this year. So Pesci Koeva Brooks, uh, We'll talk through a few of the figures we've just seen there, but let's start with that number for Germany. It is outperforming in comparison with other economies. The IMF is now less optimistic for the country for this year. Why? We see uh, different countries having been affected very differently over the past couple of years by the numerous shocks that have hit. So Germany and the euro area more broadly have been very much affected by the large energy shock, the terms of trade shock that we've observed. And that, of course, has affected inflation. It's it, uh, affected output. So we had expected a recovery to start, and we're still expecting that in for, for this year. But compared to our previous forecast for Germany, we've seen just a more sluggish kind of restart of private uh, con consumption. And sentiment has remained relatively weak. Uh, but all of that being said, we do expect the rebound to happen. As uh, inflation comes down, real incomes are going to go up. And the brunt of the monetary tightening that has happened is, is also going to materialize. So in the second half of the year, we are certainly expecting growth to, to pick up substantially. Did you find any evidence of why domestic consumption hadn't reached the sort of levels that you were expecting it to be reaching by this point? Well, I think a lot, again, has to do with the lagged effects of these shocks that we've seen. Uh, I mean, we have seen, of course, energy prices coming down, but the impact of that is going to take a while to materialize. And also, again, you know, real incomes have been eroded. So I think it's understandable that that uh, people would be a little bit more cautious uh, when they when they spend. And also compared to the U.S., um, there, I think there's been less of kind of tapping into excess savings in order to to fund uh, private uh, consumption. So that, I think, is another factor that has made a difference uh, in, in recent quarters. Uh, Germans are being a bit more frugal than you'd expected. That's one way to put it. <laughs> um, also on that map, we saw huge growth in parts of Southeast Asia, you know, in the 5 6% in Indonesia and the Philippines. Is that playing a key role in maintaining global growth? Yeah, if we look at the overall growth figure, not the revisions, but the growth, a bulk of that is really driven by uh, by countries in, uh, in Asia. It's India and even China, although uh, the growth rates, they are not as what they used to be in past years, but still very, very um, ro robust growth. And as you mentioned, Indonesia, Philippines and so on. This is a very dynamic part of the world and the underlying trend growth rates there are just significantly higher than they are in advanced economies, but also in other emerging markets re uh, regions. You mentioned China. Obviously, we just had the liquidation of Evergrande, a big property developer there. Property previously made up something like a, a fifth of the Chinese economy, but uh, no longer is that the case. But we can see that there are problems with the Chinese economy that don't appear to be going away. I mean, how contingent are the IMS forecasts on China getting to grips with all of that? 
Yeah, we have upgraded our forecast for this year uh, for, for China. And part of that has been related to just past data that we saw in 2023, but also because of the fiscal stimulus that has been provided by the, by the Chinese uh, government. All that being said, unlike at the global level where we see the risks as broadly balanced, in China we see the risks as being on the downside. And again, they're very much related to, to the potential of, um, of further issues in the property sector, uh, as well as uh, the, the possibility of a weaker external environment, which of course would, would affect the Chinese economy as well. You've also uh, increased the, the projection for growth for the United States to, to 2.1% for uh, this year, 0.6% more than previously, which is, you know, not insignificant. I mean, why, 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 why are we so much more uh, optimistic about uh, the state of play in the United States at the moment? So I think the U.S. consumer has had a lot to do with it. We've just seen... Um, uh, consumption in the U.S. Uh, really uh, continuing to be very buoyant. But stepping back, uh, we also see that the there's been more fiscal support than what we had previously uh, anticipated. And again, uh, consumers had been tapping into these access savings, uh, which has been another factor. And labor markets, by and large, have remained quite uh, resilient, uh, which is, of course, co co contributing to this picture as well. OK, well, let's now look even wider at the picture and talk about, you know, the global economy, um, all of which, of course, is contributed to by, by these figures we've already been talking about. But let's just get a quick snapshot of the state of the world economy uh, by the IMF's reckoning. Global economic growth is expected to be 3.1% this year, which is slightly up on the IMF's previous forecast. Uh, and in 2025, it's projected to be 3.2%. It's worth just bearing in mind, though, that it's still a fair bit below the pre-pandemic average for this millennium of 3.8% global growth. Anyway, let's bring back Petia Koiva brooks from the IMF. Uh, you're now more optimistic for, the global, uh, for global growth this year than, you know, just a few months ago. What's changed? Yeah, we are a bit more optimistic. Uh, we have seen a lot of resilience uh, across the board, and we've seen this in uh, economies like US and China, but also in, in a number of large emerging market economies. And the reasons for this resilience um, have to do with some of the uh, consumer spending, but also government spending, as well as on the supply side, we've been surprised by the better than expected labor force participation that we've seen. Another way of putting it that maybe the scarring from the pandemic has been less than what we had previously anticipated, which is good news. And this is also why we're seeing these uh, uh, kind of different developments on uh, inflation and growth. We have a upward revision for growth, but a downward revision for uh, inflation when we exclude um, extreme examples, uh, extreme uh, cases set such as Argentina. Yeah, in, indeed. Many central banks do appear to be uh, winning their war on inflation, a war that began during the pandemic and reached its peak in many places in 2022. So global headline inflation looks set to fall from an estimated 6.8 in 2023 to 5.8 this year and to continue towards target levels in 2025. It's falling faster in most regions than previously expected and having a, a less severe impact on employment than some had feared. You kind of just touched on this, particular over Brooks, but I mean, what, what's your assessment of the reason for inflation falling that bit faster than had been expected? Yeah, so the uh, some of the supply side, the positive supply side developments that I mentioned have played a role here. As I said, the, the labor force participation coming down, but also the, uh, the supply disruptions that had been a big issue in the past, all of those have also been um, mo moderating. Of course, monetary policy has also played its role in terms of tightening financing conditions and also through indirect effects uh, through commodity prices. The synchronized monetary tightening has made it easier for commodity prices to come down, which of course has brought down headline inflation. And finally, uh, monetary policy has really done its job in terms of 
uh, containing and preventing inflation expectations from rising and kind of contributing to a to an inflation spiral. So I think that has also been a very positive development. An overall positive uh, report does come with a, a few warnings, doesn't it? And one of those from the IMF is the the, the governments and, and central banks shouldn't declare victory over inflation too early. I mean, what's what's the danger of that? Indeed, we do see the risks at this stage to be broadly balanced uh, and to be too two sided. But I think the same can be said about monetary policy. And there is a risk that uh, and we talk about this, that there is a risk of declaring victory too early, that the problem with that would be that then the inflation problem would not be solved. A real incomes are not going to go up. And then uh, the longer the, uh, it takes to actually solve the problem, then the the, the more painful it would be to uh, to do so. So this is why we think it's so important to kind of to finish the job and to bring inflation back to target. Although, of course, there are risks in the other direction as well, and we talk about those as well. I mean, are there any signs of governments becoming complacent and and you know starting to take actions that only end up undoing some of the the good work that's been done? So our other big message on policies is that now is the time to have renewed focus on fiscal uh, consolidation. A lot of spending has been done over the past years for good reasons to help the economies recover from the pandemic, but a lot of the buffers have been depleted or clo close to that. So now is the time to, uh, to start adjustment, fiscal adjustment within medium term plans with a significant um, upfront uh, payment uh, on that adjustment. And doing so earlier rather than later would make the overall impact on growth uh, more limited and would really help, I guess, is it, prepare economies for any future shocks. Something that's also been very clear to see over the past couple of years is this fragmenting of the global economy. Effectively, what we seem to be getting is you know, China and its allies and the West on the other side. Uh, but the report from the IMF, I mean, it warns against that, citing the costs of that fragmentation. Now, the people that are participating in that fragmentation will say, it's a smart move. What does the IMF say to that? Well, we have seen, unfortunately, a rise in uh, trade restriction, in uh, export restrictions. Uh, and they've, they've really exploded over the past couple of years. And I think that has been, uh, again, a sign of the uh, fragmentation which you mentioned. This fragmentation can cover, uh, uh, can affect different areas, and we've done a lot of research on this. We've shown that its impact, ne a negative impact on FDI, on, on commodities, on uh, more, more broadly on trade. And our estimates of the overall impact for, uh, uh, for global output show that, that these numbers can be fairly large. They can be up to 7% uh, of GDP in the medium term. Although of course there's a lot of uncertainty around that. And what's important to keep in mind is that this is happening in an environment where Global growth is uh, still quite uh, modest or mediocre, I would even call it, uh, compared to the historical average. So, so uh, the fragmentation is really not something which is helping in that respect. Do you expect uh, governments and, and businesses in, for example, Europe and the United States to actually uh, take any notice of, of that warning when they've shown they're pretty keen to start to... to to reshore and to onshore their supply chains as they've been doing. So we have some, we have seen signs of, uh, of of fragmentation, but at the same time, I think it's fair to say that we've also seen a lot of resilience. So we are hopeful that uh, that uh, firms, companies, and people will adjust and would uh, would make the, the potential costs as as low as possible if those trends were to to continue. And something that looks almost certain to loom very large over 2024 are the tensions in the Middle East, which appear to just be escalating you know, by the week. Does that have a potential to undermine the IMF's forecast for this year? 
Well, this is one of the downside risks that we do mention in our report. Uh, most recently, we've seen also the developments in, uh, in, in the Red Sea, which are so far their global impact has been limited, but we've seen increase in shipping costs and such. So if, if those uh, developments were to escalate, this would come at a very unfortunate time for the global economy because, again, it would it could potentially um, increase um, I- increase costs. It could uh, increase inflation, and again, put us a little back to 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 a situation where uh, fighting inflation would be a lot more difficult. So, um, again, we're hoping that these risks would not materialize, but they're certainly on our radar. Okay, Patrick Oeva Brooks from International Monetary Fund. Thank you very much for fielding all our questions. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks a lot to you for watching. There's plenty more from the DW Business Team here on the DW News YouTube channel. So we'll see you over at whatever it is you choose to watch next. Take care.